So today we are going to continue on with engineering units and we started with pressure. So as a reminder, yesterday we talked about a term called hydrostatic pressure where if you have a column of a fluid with some height, the pressure at the bottom of that column is given by the equation rho g h plus p naught, where p naught is some pressure that is pushing on the top of that fluid. So for example, if you were going to swim down into the ocean or a lake, p naught would be the pressure of the air pushing on the surface of the water, the same pressure that we feel from the air naturally. And then you have an additional contribution from going deeper down into the dense fluid. And the way that you can think of this, right, is just imagine that you have some sort of a sensor on the bottom of this. The weight of all of the water is pushing down on a force just like if your friend was standing on your chest or something like that, right? The fluid is doing exactly the same thing. So all this here is, is just the force of all of that weight divided by an area, and that's how that term can be derived. There are three different types of pressure measurements that we will talk about. We have atmospheric pressure, Right? This is the pressure of the air that is surrounding us. So where is the pressure higher? Here in Salt Lake City or at sea level? That is because at sea level, you have a greater height of the air. Right? We're higher up. We're technically closer to outer space, but not by much. But it's enough that we have a measurable difference in the pressure. Same thing with Mount Everest. The pressure is a lot lower on Mount Everest, for example. We have absolute pressure. This is relative to a vacuum. Right, this would be the, uh, the pressure with a reference of absolutely nothing. Right, so you can imagine a membrane right, where you have some air inside of it and the other side is filled with nothing. The air inside is really going to be pushing hard to get to the nothing side. Right? That is going to be your absolute pressure. In general though, it's kind of difficult to measure absolute pressure because you need to have a reference chamber that is 100% evacuated. So what makes it a lot easier to measure is if we measure gauge pressure. And this is typically relative to atmosphere, but it doesn't have to be. Reference. So the gauge pressure, like if you're measuring your tire pressure, that's going to be gauge relative to atmosphere. But you could also have a gauge pressure that's relative from one tank to a different tank. All that's telling you is what is the pressure difference between those two chambers or those two tanks. So if we look at <clears throat> uh, a fairly common type of pressure gauge, it's called a Bourdon gauge. This is exactly what you would see in your tire pressure gauge. Right, this is your typical looking pressure gauge where you've got some needle pointing out and you've got some pressure force exerted on it. <coughs> right? Hopefully everyone's measured uh, a tire pressure. If we open this thing up and look on the inside, how it's actually built is there is a curved sort of spring here. And this is connected to a gear, which is connected to another gear, which is connected to the dial. To the what? To, uh, to a dial, to an arrow pointing out. And then you've got your number marks here. So how this gauge works is that when you put this end up against, let's say, your car's tire pressure, it is pushing, that air on the inside is pushing against this curved sort of spring. The, this part of it is open to the atmosphere. So the air in the atmosphere is pushing back 
down against it. But if the pressure on this side is higher than the other side, it compresses this, it kind of rotates the spring, it rotates this gear, and it rotates this one here, and that's how you measure the pressure in your car. So that's how these gauges work. So pressure is an extremely easy unit to measure. Temperature, which we'll talk about in a moment, is another extremely easy <coughs> unit to measure. What is difficult to measure is things like volume, right? It's really not pleasant to measure volume. Mass is easy, pressure is easy, temperature is easy. And so you'll find that oftentimes, like in thermodynamics, we always like to work with enthalpy, right? The reason why we always like to work with enthalpy is because it's a constant pressure process. Because it's easy to measure pressure, it's easier to maintain a constant pressure. Maintaining a constant volume is a, well, sometimes it's easy too if you have a vessel, but in general, we like to control temperature and pressure because we can measure it with basically just a spring, right? That's why pressure is such a useful unit. So one really common uh, <clears throat> way to measure pressure, in addition to like a, a pressure gauge like this one here, is called a manometer. So a manometer basically uses a fluid and hydro the concept of hydrostatic head to measure the pressure. So I'll draw out a, a, a large manometer. So a manometer is just basically a U-shaped tube with a fluid on the inside. And the equation that I'm going to be driving here can have up to three fluids. So generally, you will not be seeing manometers that are quite this complex. So what we have is we have a U-shaped tube, and typically these are like glass or transparent so you can see them, right, because you have to make measurements. You have some pressure. This could be from a tank. This could be from the atmosphere. It could be from anything. It's pushing on some fluid 1 with its density 1 and its height in the U-shaped tube D1. You've got the working fluid, which we have as a density of rho f, the density of fluid f. And you have some P2 pushing on the other side with an additional fluid, rho 2, and its height d2. Now how the manometer works, right? So let's just say conceptually, which of these two pressures do we think is higher, P1 or P2? P1, right? Because you can just imagine this is a straw and you're pushing down into it a little bit, right? You can displace the, the, the liquid in a straw without bubbling it just by pressurizing that side a little. But this dashed line right here, the pressure is constant, right? Because you have, there's no additional movement, right? You can drop a line right here where the working fluid is at exactly the same height. So the pressure right here is constant across both sides. So what we need to do is take our hydrostatic head equation here and just add in all of the different contributions from all of the different fluids to see, hey, we have equivalency right here. Let's derive an equation to work with. So at the dashed line, we have a constant pressure. So on the left-hand side, we have to see what are all of the contributions from pressure. Right? We have P1, which is pushing down on the top of the column, and we have the hydrostatic pressure from fluid 1. So we have P1 plus rho 1 G D1. That's the pressure on the left-hand side at the dashed line. This is equal to the pressure being pushed down on the right-hand side. We have P2 plus the contribution from fluid 2 plus the contribution from the working fluid F, the density of F, G, and H. This is the right-hand side. And we call this the general manometer equation. 
<clears throat> okay, so this structure here for the manometer, this general equation, is typically one that we wouldn't use all that often for a couple of reasons. One, fluid one and fluid two, right, and the working fluid would all have to be immiscible. They couldn't mix, right? So let's say fluid one and fluid two were an airstream, for example. Typically, we, we neglect the density of the air going through a tube of, you know, a couple feet in height, right? Because it takes miles of air, basically, to squeeze down to give us 14 PSI. So this is the type of equation we don't generally see, but we're going to take it and we're going to simplify it for some more commonly uh, seen types of manometers. So the most common one that we'll see is called the differential manometer. And the point of this is to measure the pressure drop going through some process or pipeline. And if we know the pressure drop going through it, we can use that as a way to actually calculate the volumetric flow rate through correlations. So if we have uh, <clears throat> some process here, right, where we have a fluid flowing, and I'm breaking it up here to indicate that maybe it's a long section of pipe, or maybe it's a complex series of bends and valves, or whatever the case is. And then we're going to connect these two ends here with a manometer uh, <clears throat> with some working fluid on the inside. So we're still going to have our P1 and our P2. We're going to have some working fluid, right? Fluid one, fluid two, and then our working fluid here, F. Now, what we're interested in a differential manometer is we want to know what is the pressure drop going from P1 to P2. And how I've drawn this, right, I've drawn it so that P1 is greater than P2. And this is typically going to be the case if you're flowing in this direction, because as you flow, your pressure is going to be going lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. Right? That's why if you drink from, like, let's say, a straight straw versus one of those crazy, wacky, curly straws, it's a lot harder to pull the liquid through those wacky straws because there's a lot more sort of bends and kinks and length associated with it. Right? So the same concept with that is present in a chemical process as well. So what we're interested in is the delta P. Now, delta is something that we'll be using a lot in this class. And this typically refers to out minus in or final minus initial. And so in this case here, this is going to be P2, well, let's see. Well, delta P is going to be negative. Uh, never mind. Let's forget about the delta P. I actually don't want to calculate that in this, in this example. Would it be negative because it's a drop in pressure? It would be negative, and that's why I wanted to avoid the confusion. <laughs> so in this case, we're actually just going to calculate P1 minus P2, which would be the amount of pressure that's lost, which would be a positive number, which is going to be a bit more fun to uh, work with. So what we need to do is basically just take the general manometer equation and simplify it down. In this case here, what we're going to say is we're going to say that fluid 1 is equal to fluid 2. So in this case, rho 1 is equal to rho 2. And I'm going to skip over the math a little bit, uh, but we can derive the expression that gh is equal to rho f minus rho. So basically, all we need to measure a pressure drop going through a flow system is the density of a working fluid, the density of your process stream, and the height that the level of the water or fluid has been displaced. So with a very simple U-shaped tube. Now this doesn't even have to be like a solid glass tube. This could be like a flexible piece of clear plastic tubing, right? So, and then with this information, and you know the pressure loss, you can use correlations that you'll talk about in your flow, a fluid mechanics class to measure what the flow rate is. So it's a really simple, cheap, easy to use device uh, that you'll see in your senior lab, and you can use it to measure all sorts of different phenomena. Yeah, question. Does the little wavy part through the pipe just represent just more pipe? Yeah, it could be more pipe, or it could be a, it could be a process flow, it could be a unit operation, it could be a whole bunch of different other things. Like a heat exchanger, or, or something where you care to know how much pressure you're losing going through that particular unit. <clears throat> 
So that one, this is called a uh, differential pressure phenomenon. So it's useful for measuring the pressure drop going through a process and also using it to actually measure flow rates. You don't actually measure the flow rate, but you're inferring the flow rate. A couple of other ones that are useful. An open-ended manometer is where we have a fluid flowing through a pipeline, for example. And you have a manometer that is just open to the atmosphere. In this case here, the fluid on the inside is at a lower pressure than the atmosphere based on how I've drawn it. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And we also have a sealed end. So this is like a mercury barometer or mercury manometer. So the reason why mercury is used is because it's extremely uh, dense. So water, if I were to make a sealed end manometer, the atmospheric pressure pushing on us is about 14.7 psi at sea level here. Uh, it's like maybe a little less than 14 psi, maybe 13 something. It would take about 30 feet of water Right? So every 10 meters that you swim down into the ocean or the lake, you get about one more atmosphere of pressure pushing down on you. So if you wanted to make a manometer with uh, a fluid like water and its density, you would need a column that is 30 feet high just to push off the air that's pushing down on us. Now the reason why we're not squeezed out is because we're breathing in the air at the same pressure. So internally, our body is also at an absolute pressure of about 14.7 as well. That's why we're not getting imploded. So when you go scuba diving, for those of you who are scuba enthusiasts, right, you actually breathe in air at the pressure of the water that you are at, which is also why you don't implode. Right? Uh, but the issue, though, is that if you depressurize too quickly and go back up and you don't breathe, so for example, one of the worst things you can do in scuba diving is to hold your breath. So if you hold your breath and then swim up, your lungs can actually rupture because the air inside of your lungs was breathed in at a lower position, at a higher pressure, and then you go back up again and it wants to get out. So the cardinal rule of scuba diving is always keep breathing. Do not stop breathing, otherwise you will get crushed or you'll explode. Either two options are undesirable. So mercury, so mercury is really useful because its density is a lot, lot higher than water's is. So how people make a closed end mercury manometer is you get a long tube that has a closed end and you pour a bunch of mercury inside of it and you top it off and then you take it and you very gently put it into a liquid, right, so you make a seal. And then what happens is the mercury on, in, in the top kind of gets going down and down and down and down. So you're forming a vacuum based on, uh, based on the lack of air at the top of that column. And the only thing holding the liquid in there is the air pressure pushing down around it. But mercury is useful, right, of course, because it's extremely dense fluid. Okay, that wraps up our pressure discussion. The key thing to keep in mind with pressure is reference states. This is the one that you will make the most mistakes on. If I were to use the ideal gas law, which pressure do I need to use? Absolute, Absolute pressure. What temperature do I need to use? Absolute. Absolute. So that's a good transition into what we'll be talking about now, which is temperature. So I'm going to kind of breeze through this. Um, uh, please refer to the book uh, if you have any questions on temperature, but I think most people have seen the different types of temperature units. Okay, one important point about temperature. We can't actually measure it. And up until about the early 1900s or the late 1800s, 
what temperature actually was, was, was mostly unknown. Right? Until the invention or discovery of atomic theory, we didn't have a good physical understanding of what temperature is. Now, you guys all get to learn in hindsight, we know that temperature now is the average kinetic energy of the motion of molecules. What this means for us, though, is that I don't have in my toolbox a average kinetic energy of atoms ometer, right? So in temperature, we never actually directly measure temperature. We only infer what temperature is. Now, the most common type of thermometer that everyone would be familiar with is one that kind of looks like this, right, where you've got a bead of liquid at the bottom. It goes to some position right here, and maybe this is red so you can see easily. In olden days it was mercury, but people don't like mercury because it's very toxic. So what happens is, is that as the temperature goes up, the density of the fluid goes down and it causes the height to move up. We're not actually measuring the temperature here, are we? What we're doing is we're basically measuring how much does the volume change of my working fluid as a result of the temperature of its surroundings. And then we've just correlated that measurement to, <clears throat> to known densities of that particular fluid. Another very common way is a thermocouple. And this is where you have two wires that are soldered together, but they have different, it's a different type of metal, A, and metal B. When you have two metals in contact, something happens. Does anyone know? You might, you might have heard this term before. It's like the reason why you don't want to put like a steel pipe to a copper pipe. Yeah. Uh, you will have conduction, but there's a more general term called galvanic corrosion. Right? So these two metals, the electrons on their surface, have different energy levels. And so when you put those electrons together, the electrons want to flow from one to the other. And this will result in a voltage difference between metal A and metal B. Now this is a function of temperature. So as the temperature changes, the voltage difference between those two changes. So the most common way that we measure temperature in the lab or in an industrial process is we will take two metals, put them together, and then we just basically measure the voltage difference between these two metals and correlate that to a well-known standard table saying, oh, if this is copper and this is zinc, right, then we know that a voltage difference of 3 milliwatts corresponds to a temperature of X or whatever the case is. Yeah? With the surface area of where they connect matter? Good question. I don't think it does. It have to be uniform, wouldn't it? But I think the surface area, so you have, so you have something called contact resistance. Uh, and so the greater the surface area you have, the less contact resistance you'll have probably. So it may, I'm sure it affects the quality control of these units, but physically, if you have no contact resistance, I'm not sure if it matters. But I will stand here proud and say I am not an expert on thermocouples. So I'm not, I'm not sure the exact details of whether that's going to be the case or not. But very good question. Okay, so in temperature, we have very, we have four, yeah, you have a question. Yeah, um, with those standard tables, like for the thermometer or the thermocouple, mm -hmm. um, how were those made? Like how were those differences related originally to the average kinetic energy? So typically we'll do that based on like standards or reference states. So we'll calibrate something based on the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. And we know what those happen at 0 and 100. And then we kind of have to get a linear scale. And if needed, you could have uh, other complex mixtures where you can boil them. Because at phase changes, the temperatures are constant, and so it's a really good way to uniformly calibrate things. So if I were to go in the lab and I didn't trust this thing, I would throw it in a pot of boiling water. Or I would put it in, actually, no, that's probably not the best way because the temperature that water boils at will change based on the atmospheric pressure. So the better way would probably be an ice bath. So that's, that's, that's how I would calibrate that. Uh, any other questions? Keep them coming. These are good questions. Keep me on my toes. Okay, so the units of temperature. 
that we will most commonly see are Fahrenheit, Rankine, Celsius, and Kelvin. Let me write that down. Now, <clears throat> the reference states are what's mattering here. <laughs> so let's start off with the simple ones. Ranking and Kelvin, the reference state is absolute zero. Meaning that zero Kelvin and zero ranking means the coldest that we can ever get to. And in fact, we can never reach absolute zero. It is physically impossible or rather thermodynamically impossible to reach absolute zero. But we can get very close. So people have gotten within like 10 to the minus 9 uh, close to absolute zero. But we can never technically reach absolute zero so, uh, because it's a problem with entropy. Yes, so, Yeah. So why, what is it with entropy that restricts? So the reason why you can't reach absolute zero basically comes down to how temperature is defined thermodynamically. So in your Thermo 2 class, and this, is, this is something that, that, that I go over. I teach graduate thermodynamics as well. Temperature is defined as, hopefully I don't get this right, uh, it is d u d s at constant v. Right? So it's how the energy of the system changes with respect to how its entropy changes. Now the difficulty here is that effectively, and I'll skip over the math a little bit, but it requires you to remove an infinite amount of entropy to get the system to actually go to zero. Okay. That's the gist of really what it is. Uh, but in general, it's not possible. But that's, but that's mathematically. So from thermodynamics perspective, this is a bit of a side tangent, U, S, and V are the primary units of the universe. So U is the energy, right? S is the entropy, and V is basically the volume of the real space that the universe exists in. Temperature and pressure are not base units, they're derived units, right? So temperature is how the internal energy changes with respect to entropy, and pressure is defined as how the internal energy changes with respect to the volume at con constant entropy. But uh, not, not, not relevant in this class, per se. Okay. <clears throat> So back to our temperature units. Fair, uh, so let's, let's start with Celsius. What's the reference state for Celsius? So it's zero degrees C. We know it's zero, but what is zero degrees C defined as? Yes, water freezing point. Freezing point of water under standard atmospheric conditions. Fahrenheit. What is the reference state of Fahrenheit? Does anyone know this one? Yeah. Uh, that is one, but what's the zero reference state? So it's actually the freezing point of a brine. More or less the ocean's freezing point is zero degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, Mr. Daniel Fahrenheit gets a bad rap, right? Because Celsius just seems oh so convenient, right? It's the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. So Fahrenheit was defined based on the freezing point of a brine, which to my best understanding is effectively approximately the salinity of the ocean, right? So the ocean will freeze at about zero degrees Fahrenheit. And 100 degrees Fahrenheit was actually his best estimate of what the human body temperature was. So that's why I stick by Fahrenheit when I'm looking at the weather forecast, right? Because I feel it's a little bit more relevant to what the human body experiences. Right? If I'm seeing the ocean freeze over, or the Great Salt Lake freeze over, I know it's going to be very cold. And if it's above my body temperature, I know it's going to be very hot. Right? But anyway, so those are the differences between uh, Fahrenheit and uh, Celsius in terms of reference. Now, the confusing part about temperatures is that uh, temperature is both an interval and a measurement. What I mean by that is that if I were to draw out a, uh, a sort of a number line here, and I were to have temperature in degrees Celsius and temperature in 
units of Kelvin, and by convention, we don't write degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. I could say that at temperature zero, Kelvin is 273, 0.15, but whatever. And over here, if I say this is 5, this would be 278. So the temperature here is 5 degrees Celsius, or 278 Kelvin. But the delta T is 5, and the delta T is 5. So Celsius and Kelvin have the same interval, but they have different references. So when you're converting between temperatures, you first have to change the reference, then you have to change the interval. Right? And that's why you have like the you know, plus 32 or minus 32, depending on whether or not you're translating from uh, Fahrenheit to uh, Celsius. The same thing can be said here if you look in degrees Fahrenheit, using the same starting point, oops, 32, which is the freezing point of water, and temperature in degrees ranking is 492. That's the freezing point of water. So in this case here, the delta T is 9. So the interval difference between Celsius and Fahrenheit or ranking is for every 5 Celsius, you get 9 Fahrenheit. But that's the interval. But converting between temperature units is not just as simple as timesing it by 5 or dividing it by 9. Right? You have to shift the reference as well. So the equations to do that are readily available, so I'm not going to put them up on the board here. But the key thing to keep in mind is when you're talking about temperature, you have to be aware of, am I talking about the, ref like the, the actual temperature, or am I talking about a temperature interval? Right? So if I tell you that this room here is, let's say, I don't know, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, right? that's a temperature. But if I'm going to say that the heat capacity of something is x degrees Celsius per Kelvin per mole, that is an interval. Right? So if I'm looking at heat capacity units, it doesn't matter if it's joules per mole Kelvin or joules per mole Celsius. Those are exactly the same units because that's an interval, and these two have the same interval. Likewise, if I look at heat capacity in SI units, it could be BTUs per pound Fahrenheit or BTUs per pound Kelvin. Crystal clear? Okay. So this wraps up our discussion of units, and now we can start talking about processes. Is there any questions about hydrostatic head, temperature, pressure, unit <coughs> conversions, systems of units, anything like that. Okay. So with the last little bit that we have of class, we're going to go over uh, different types of systems. So what we're mostly interested in this class is going to be solving for how much material, how much energy, how long things are going to take in order to perform different types of processes. But first, we need to go over what the types of processes are and how we can appro make approximations based on that. So this is chapter four in the Felder and Rousseau books. We've breezed through the first three chapters in the course of about two and a half days. So let's talk about processes. This is, of course, process engineering. The first one is a batch process. This is effectively where we will, let's say, load stuff into a beaker or some sort of other vessel. We will wait some time. Right? Maybe this is a chemical reaction. A plus B goes to C or something like that. And then after some other period of time, we're going to drain the system out. Right? That is a batch process. We fill it up. We wait, we drain it. This is still the way that most pharmaceuticals are made. This is the way that ice cream is made. This is the way that some candies are made, right? But not everything is a batch process. In general, batch processes are not fun, right? We don't prefer batch processes as chemical engineers, right? We will use a batch if we have to. 
But I'll talk about why we don't like that in just a moment. That's process type number one. Can anyone think of a batch process in your daily life? What's something that you might consider to be a batch? Coffee. Coffee? And a <laughs> Coffee and a French press, yes. Uh, making a smoothie. Yep, you throw everything in, you blend it, you take it out. Uh, baking cookies, that's a batch process. So most everything that we deal with in our daily lives is going to be either a batch or what we call a semi-batch. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, that's because for us, it's easier to control just pouring something into a container and then pouring something back out of a container. Now the process that I'm going to be talking about right now is a continuous process. These are very difficult to control, and so that means we typically don't bother with them in our daily lives. Now, typically, continuous processes are called steady state. Now, what steady state means is that if you, I have any differential term that is with respect to time, this could be the mass changing as a function of time, the temperature changing as a function of time, the composition changing as a function of time, everything is equal to zero. Everything is constant perfectly as a function of time. There's no invariation. But of course, this is only true after you integrate over a certain period of time, because there's always going to be little micro fluctuations here or there. But on average, over a long period of time, there is no difference whether or not I look at the system now, or an hour from now, or a day from now, or a week from now. So an example of this is a boiler. So if I flow in liquid water, into some sort of a boiler unit. Now I can either have some sort of an electrical heating element here, or I could have a combustion reaction going on on the inside with some gases flowing through, and I want to spit out water vapor. That is a continuous process. The rate that I feed the liquid water into the boiler, the rate that I feed electrical power into the system to heat it up, and the rate that everything comes out is invariant as a function of time. This is what we like as chemical engineers. Now, the reason why we prefer continuous processes is because we can decide what is the best temperature, what is the best pressure, what is the best composition, that this system gives us the best efficiency to accomplish a given task. Then we're going to lock it in. Right? We want to get this system set up so that it is perfectly optimized to give us the most profitability. We don't want to worry about any of these transient times where it's not perfectly uniform and optimized. We want to nail it perfectly straight on and say, this is the way we can make the most amount of money. Let's get the system to this temperature, get the system to this pressure, and make as much money as we can. Right? This is why chemical engineers prefer this. But the issue, though, is let's say you have a, oops, a little fluctuation in your flow rate here. Well, maybe you need to amp up the energy going out here. Maybe you're not making 100% you know, water vapor going out the other side. So you need a complex controls process that says, oh, I'm going to measure how much water is flowing through the system, and if I get a hiccup, I need to put more energy into the system here, or I need to close a valve to counteract this. Right? So you need a really complex control scheme in order to keep things at the constant optimized amount. And when I'm baking cookies, I don't really have that kind of control. But my car does. Right? So when you're driving your car down the road, it's controlling all of that, making sure that it's got just the right amount of gas, just the right amount of oxygen to give you the most efficient that that engine can possibly put out. Okay. Any questions? And the last one <clears throat> before we depart is what we're going to call a semi-batch process. Semi-batch, or sometimes I'll call them transient. Now, an example of this uh, would be like a crystallizer. So if I've got some, like, uh, let's say I'm trying to make rock candy, right? That's effectively a crystallization process. I've got some sort of a solute that's dispersed in a liquid. And over time, I am letting the liquid evaporate out, and I'm looking to form a nice uniform crystal. Right? This is different than a batch process, because in a batch process, 
Nothing is going in or out. I'm locking them in and I'm taking it out. So in reality, everything is really a semi-batch or a transient process. Right? Because let's take, for example, the cookie example. I throw all the ingredients into a bowl and I throw them into the oven after I, of course, put them on a cookie sheet. But they're changing a little bit, right? You're putting energy into the system, so the temperature of the cookies are changing a little bit as a function of time, or there's some steam that's given off. So everything in reality is, in many ways, a semi-batch or transient process. But typically for calculations, we'll like to assume they're either, either a batch or a continuous uh, process. <coughs> And these are the types of systems that we'll be talking about, and we'll be expanding on them uh, quite a bit more significantly. So we're out of time, uh, but have a good weekend. There's no class on Monday, uh, so we'll talk about balances on Wednesday, and homework is due one week from today. So hold on, one last comment on the homework. Uh, I have it listed as due at the start of class, but Canvas says it's due at midnight. So basically what I'm saying is that no more questions, no more help from the start of the class onwards, but if you have any issues printing stuff out or scanning it in, that is the grace period that you have up until midnight. But when midnight comes, it's going to be a hard shut and it's going to be late. So that's a grace period.